welcome back and uh, we appreciate your patience and your commitment to, to these sessions and we are happy with your resistance to follow up and also give your inputs and participate in the discussion. Please allow me to brief you again about the program or the remaining sessions of the program. We'll have uh, shortly a session that will address the violent and peaceful means towards justice and peace that will be moderated by my colleague and our academic director, Professor Mohammed Ghali. I will invite him and his team shortly. But before that, I'm happy to inform and uh, announce that our learned scholar, Dr. Tarq Ramadan, will also have a session before the closing of this conference, just immediately after the last session uh, after lunch break, the third session. After that, Dr. Tarq Ramadan will have a time to wrap up the conference and then we will close. So I would like now to invite Dr. Mohammed Ghali and his team, Dr. Jerome, Sheikhna Al Mokre, Abu Zaid, and my colleague, Dr. Mohammed Al Mukhtar Shinqiti, to come to the stage. It's with great pleasure and honor that I introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Mohammed Ghali, who is the academic director at Kyle, and he is also the coordinator of the Islamic Studies program in the College of Islamic Studies. In brief, my best introduction to Dr. Mohammed Ghali, he is a young scholar and promising leader. Dr. Ghali, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It's my honor and great pleasure to moderate uh, this session. <coughs> uh, the session, the panel, is about peaceful and violent means towards a just peace. And we have three distinguished speakers, our Sheikh Abu Zaid al Mukhri al Idrisi and uh, Dr. Mukhtar al Shankiti and uh, Dr. Jerome Driven. I'm very happy to be with them today and to discuss this topic. Without further notice, I give them directly the um, floor. And we start with uh, Sheikh Abu Zid al Mukri al Idrisi. Please. You have 20 minutes. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, all praises due to Allah. May Allah send his peace and blessings to Prophet Muhammad, his household, and all his companions, ladies and gentlemen. May the, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. This seems to be a paper to defend Islam from the stigma of terror and violence, but it's not like that because there are people who are qualified to do that irrespective of the media attacks and the political bombardment. And as I am trying to speak about terror, which is a political manufacturing and intelligence and media efforts to combat Islam. But we are responsible to speak about ourselves, first of all. We should recognize that we have knowledge and historical roots to resort to violence uh, through religion as what happened during the time of Khawarij or the outlaws. Before Islam, at the beginning of mankind, the first moment of violence was exercised by a brother against his brother at the time of no uh, 
a clash of interests, and there was only one family consisting of less than 10 individuals, yet the brother said to his brother, I will kill you, and he did. And these were the two sons of Adam, peace be upon him. Islam has the trinity of power, violence, and terrorism. The materialistic power is the foundation for this universe, and so this power or strength is supported in Islam. The Quran says, O oh, Yahya, take on the book we reveal to you with power and strength. But sometimes it is used arbitrarily and it turns into violence. And this is negative uh, understanding and condemned in Quran. Quran has clarified this many times in terms of Abil killing Habil. Uh, going on to the Pharaoh and the people of the ditch and how they were burnt and killed. The main problem here is to realize the demarcation between violence and power because this line of demarcation moves on and intertwines according to interests, even linguistically speaking, the Quran says Allah is the most high and Fir'aun is the one who is trying to become high. So this shows that there is intertwining between the two levels, the legitimate and the illegitimate use of force. Allah is almighty, Allah is most high. And Fir'aun has transgressed on earth and also Allah said the children of Israel will rise. So this is mentioned in the Quran. When violence is becoming institutionalized ideologically and it turns into a social or political or military movement, it becomes terrorism. And here Quran has a linguistic problem, which is the terrorism was translated as terrorism in the 18th century. And then before that is what was projected on the Quran by centuries. So we are embarrassed when we speak about terrorism in Quran. And to save the Quran from the political expediency internally and externally, Quran used the issue of terrorism uh, positively. Six times, all my slaves fear me, and in a way that is condemned, which is, and they have spread fear in the hearts of the people, speaking about the magicians, and also the context even is used by Islamists, is that you spread fear in the hearts of the enemies of Allah. I realize I need to slow down a little bit, but I have to say what I have to say because I have 38 pages and I apologize for speaking too fast and I apologize to the interpreter if I have exhausted him. The only problem is that out of eight times, it is mentioned one time as you spread fear in the hearts of your enemy and the enemies of Allah. The understanding of terrorism here is out of deterrence. That is to do the opposite of the meaning of terrorism in understandings projected on our religion as our deceived sons uh, are, are understanding. The Quran says, prepare so that you prepare to spread fear in the hearts of your enemies. And Quran speaks about this as an integrated system, positively and negatively. Negatively, when Allah willed the Battle of Badr to take place, there was no fear in the hearts of the people. That's why Allah said, when Allah shows them in your heart and eyes a few so that Allah will decree what he wants to decree. And the opposite happened by the will of Allah. 
which is Allah has stopped them from harming you and stopped you from harming them in the uh, part of Mecca. Otherwise, the conquest of Mecca would have been bloody. However, the Prophet, peace be upon him, told the people of Quraysh, go and you are set free. I will not harm any of you. So this linguistic and conceptual uh, narration is not enough. So I spoke uh, about following the general personality that rules those who exercise violence. Can a country like the United States, for example, today, or such as what we've seen in the Spanish Inquisition or Daesh uh, barbarism, these are all one and the same. The only the slogans are different. This is based on three things. The first motivation is rejecting the other and his presence here must be eliminated. Buddhists nowadays say to the Rohingya, you have to leave. The Rohingya said, we want to convert to Buddhism. Will you accept us? They said, no. You as an entity, you are called Arakan. You are Muslims of Rakhine, are unaccepted. Go commit suicide in the Bengali Bay, Bangladesh Bay. So you are rejected even bodily. And the blacks were rejected in their presence when they were brought in by the watch. The Ku Klux Klan would burn them just because they are blacks. The other thing is that they, he may accept you, but he rejects your differing with him. The third one, which is the most deep, and uh, communism has done that over 70 years, which is believing that man is uh, an entity to be oppressed. Lenin would said, uh, violence is a way of convincing, and he would expel the scholars and the biology scholars to the gulag, thinking that oppression will change man's convictions. Islam does not believe in something called rejecting the other, because the universe is based on uh, self and the other, and difference is a natural way. And Islam does not believe at all that a man uh, is to be oppressed in order to change his convictions and beliefs. You can oppress a person in his body or social stat status or in his emotions, but you cannot oppress him at all into forcing his convictions. That's why Allah has created man free. Bigovich said the biggest sign in the book of Allah is that Allah created man free while he could be an atheist. And man will not go to the end of time except through programming his tools, even though these tools sometimes are more skillful than man, such as the computers and uh, airplanes. But man wants to use something to be programmed. Allah created man unable to be programmed, and he can move against his creator or even. And this is evidence that man is free. The magicians of Pharaoh told Pharaoh, do whatever you want. You will only end this worldly life. You can crucify us, you can kill us, but you will not be able to reach our souls because this is a liberated area. Islam did not only give evidence to that and that he believes in the other and the difference and that man is not to be subject to oppression, but he has provided the theory in order to manage coexistence based on three layers. The first one is conceptual, the third one is ethical, the third one is practical. The conceptual, which is the common ground, all you people of the book come to uh, so that we will have common ground between us, which is that we worship none but Allah that we worship none but Allah and do not associate any partners with him. The second one is ethical, which is dialogue. And yesterday that was mentioned. And I have 
given a chapter for that in my book. The third one, which is cooperation. Islam has given us fields of cooperation. And Dr. Ramadan said, Quran is a legislation also for non-Muslims. So Allah said, the food of the people of the book is allowed for you and your food is allowed for them, etc. Also, the women of the people of the book are allowed for you in marriage. So Allah said, Allah does not forbid you from being kind to those who do not kill you and do not aid in expelling you from your home towns and whole countries that you be kind to them so quran has put the cap which is being kind and given to those who do not fight against you or expel you from your land and expel you in order to get you out of your faith so Violence, before it is condemned ethically, it is even condemned technically, and it would not lead to any result. Islam has exercised that on the Prophet, peace be upon him, who had an uncle who would love him and aid him, yet he was uh, a non-believer. So he was taught that this man who is your uncle and you love him and he aids you yet he did not believe in you and your message so allah said to the prophet you muhammad will not guide those whom you love but allah guides those whom he wills and another verse and uh, which is if allah wills all of the people on earth would believe. Are you Muhammad to compel people to become believers? So there are deterrent verses that you will not be able to use violence. Allah has sent Prophet Muhammad to guide humanity, yet he has forbidden him from thinking even for a moment that he can compel them to believe. So this is an ethical way and no prophet was a king except David and Solomon. And these were the only exceptions. They came after Moses by decades. But the other prophets were uh, shepherds, were poor people. They had no financial, media, or political clout. They were even orphans, and they were vulnerable. Why? If a prophet is to use force as a way of compulsion, he would not find it. He was deprived from that. Prophets did not have bodyguards or armies. Most of the prophets were killed. And Allah said to Prophet Muhammad, Allah will protect you from people. He was subject to 12 assassination attempts, nine of them by the Jews, three by the polytheists. So, how can Islam be a faith calling for peace and freedom? Even the greeting is peace be upon you. And Allah, one of his names is peace. And Allah said, enter, O oh, you believers, into Silm or peace or Islam. So is this a parad paradoxy or schizophrenia between calling for peace and legitimizing jihad? I said that uh, and I spoke about that in details against those who said Quran or Islam was spread by the use of the sword. Uh, the Orientalists are the ones who said that, that Islam was spread by power or the sword. If we were to use that, then we would say Christianity was spread by using the canon or the... In three continents out of five, uh, Christianity was spread by using guns or cannons. So you cannot compare that in different standards. Even Jesus is not comparable to Muhammad, peace be upon him, because he was not tested with establishing a state. You can compare Muhammad, peace be upon him, with Jesus, peace be upon him, when Muhammad was in Mecca, not when he was in Medina as a statesman. The, the state management is something different. 
anyone who wants to compare Muhammad and Jesus, then let him compare Muhammad and Jesus when Muhammad was in Mecca, and you will find them both copy of one another. If Jesus was tried to be having to establish a state and fight and have a military, then the situation would have been different. Also, the texts, the pretext for fighting was imposed upon you and it was something uh, hated by you and in self-criticism, I loathe when people speak about verses that have been abrogated where the sword was allowed to be used. So some jurists in some pretexts said that. Also the practical pretext, uh, the verses of jihad is a pronunciation or uh, announcing war. Look at a general when he gathers his soldiers and he would say attack. Can we confine a culture and society and religion in one single moment when the general says attack? So in terms of the details of the differences and the use of weapons, this is something different related to the text and pretext of history. The pretext of jihad are not as a command or ritualistic. Islam speaks about slavery and oppression. These are not for uh, anything except to deal with realities that exist. War was and would remain. And a journey of 50 years by a scholar scientist said that in the last 7,000 of documented history, there is a cycle every 14 years in the movement of people. Every 13 years, there's one year of peace only. That is applied in the Romans and the Greeks until the 20th century. So this scholar or philosopher found out that one out of 14 years would be peace. So the secularists condemn Islam that it allowed war and no peace. Also the fourth pillar, which is the most important, which is talking to these people who are prone to violence, I will read the themes. Uh, I have spoken about propensity by youth to lean toward violence and terrorism, and there's a misunderstanding of the use of power in the Quran, taking uh, text out of their context, the combination between right and wrong, and then the psychological layer, and then the mental, and then the methodological and the political level. I am sorry for being brief. May the peace of Allah be upon you all. Thank you for abiding by the time allocated. We'd like to give the floor now to Dr. Muhammad Mukhtar Shanqiti. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Islam is not the religion of the sword, of the wood, or the wood. It is not the religion of peace or war. It is the religion of justice, whether it is going to be achieved through war or peace. So there shouldn't be a pre disposed judgment about that. That is why I do not think uh, that Muslims need to be apologetic. And unfortunately, this is an issue that we suffer from because we accept to be cornered sometimes uh, and to be in a situation of self-defense. We do fight others on our own grounds. 
and we discuss with others on the basis of our own religion. Our religion is the accused, and we defend it. Our lands witnesses bloodshed. This is because we Muslims lost confidence and we have been suffering from a disease of a shaken personality and a loss of self-confidence. Islam is a comprehensive kind of religion. It is the seal of all messages and all religions are partial because they don't cover all components of our life and all monotheistic religions are particular to certain period of time. Jesus Christ came with a message from within an established state and came into a community in which there is the Roman law, but Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent into a religion, into a state, into which or into an area where there is political vacuum. If we compare this religion, which is a comprehensive religion that came to cover all components of our life, compared to a partial religion, it is a religion that is that has come to revive all our aspects of life. That is why Islam is a comprehensive, realistic religion. Ali Izzat Bigovic pointed to the comprehensiveness and realism of religion and uh, and he talked about uh, the idealism and realism and he talked about the old testament and this reality so islam is a copy of the human being or the mankind uh, so what is in islam is what is in our mankind uh, we have things to do with the spark of reality and there are certain aspects that are not pleasing to romantic poets. In Islam, there are certain components that uh, romantic poets would not appreciate. Uh, so uh, Quran is a realistic kind of book. No place in it uh, for epic uh, or epical components uh, or particularities. Uh, it is not in keeping with Buddha or a kind of a reviving ideology in keeping with the Christian message or Christ's <coughs> message. That is why Islam, as Ali Izzat Bigovic says, it is a mundane religion. It is in keeping with politics in its expanded form of the word. And Ali Izzat Bigovish realized that there is a kind of a inability in the Christian culture to understand the personality of Prophet Muhammad and the Christian ideology did not accept that a human being would be just a human being. Prophet Muhammad compared between the human being and the soldier, but uh, Christ came up with a further dimension, which is an angelic kind of dimension. Prophet Muhammad came up with a realistic kind of dimension. He would participate in wars and would give us ethical answers to the questions that are being posed. And God Almighty mentioned that in the book. If there were angels walking and strolling on earth, we would have sent them angels. So we can take this issue based on the meaning of the text in its uh, form of establishment or the way it was established, or maybe we can take it within the framework of the historical dimension that is different uh, from the old kind of clashes in the text. Uh, 
Islam gave two or three motivations for jihad or fighting. The first one is self-defense. Uh, permission has been given to those who are being fought uh, because they were wronged. Uh, peace, people who have been subjected to injustices on the level of the creed and on the level of what they own or on the level of their own nation. Those who fought you and evicted you from your own homes. So they fought you to make you out of your own country. So one of the motivations is the defense, self-defense, the defense of the creed, or in defense of the fact that you have been evicted from your own country. The second motivation is to defend the vulnerable. And the third dimension is to guarantee freedom of worship to all religions. And this is one of the first ayahs in jihad. And were there not that Allah checks the people, some by means of others, they would have been demolished, they would have seen, well, I would have seen demolished monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques. Uh, this is al-jihad as we see it in the text without any historical interpretations. And of course, Islam was uh, born in an empirical kind of context. Uh, so there aren't any recognized borders. There isn't no UN, no system as it is the case today. So it is a context in which there is war against everybody. And there were two choices, either to enter the empirical context with the uh, reasonable or the basis of uh, conquest or invasion, either to enter into that kind of uh, context or into that realm, or to wait until the Byzantines or the Persians will come to invade them. So that is why Islamic jurisprudence, which is pertaining to jihad, it is a jurisprudence that has been drafted as a result of empirical clashes. So it is a kind of jurisprudence that should not be followed in the era of states. Uh, so we have a number of real estate estates or states uh, that have borders and demarcations not similar to the empirical kind of context. There isn't a, a point of attack and a point of defense because both of them are the same and the geography has nothing to do with these dimensions. But in the state context, things have become different. Most countries of the world cannot protect themselves. They can only resort to this new norm that has given to regional sovereignty a kind of an ethical and legal position and dimension. Of course, in Islam, there are a number of texts that can be explained as it is a uh, green light to wage war against the world. Uh, and the same applies to Christianity. Uh, when you read uh, fight, uh, the polytheists, all of them, these are texts uh, that would be understood that they call for waging war against others. But when we look into the Old Testament and the wars of the uh, Lord or the battlefields or battles of, uh, uh, and also when we talk about the fighting Lord in uh, Samuel and uh, in the Exodus uh, and uh, the call for uh, the killing of women and children in Deuteronomy 7.2, and even in the New Testament uh, that uh, is not expected to include any call for violence in Matthew in uh, uh, 10 34 do not think that i have come for peace but i come through the sword jesus christ says so all the people of religion they explain their own 
tax, religious tax, and uh, try to imply the general on the restricted, and they go to the things that are constants, and they try to e interpret these texts in the light of these constants. So this is a right to those religious people, because they want to make of those texts messages of love and peace. And this is what was referred to by Tariq Ramadan. Some people explain their texts in their own context, and they try to come up with a historical kind of interpretation, and at the same time, do not give this right to Muslims. So Islam does not have double standardness in this respect. Islam did not claim that it is the religion of love and did not claim that it is the religion of peace. Uh, Islam called upon people to be just and to defend themselves and also to support the vulnerable. Islam has given the right to people to defeat those who subject them to injustices, it has given the right to people to defeat those who have oppressed them. So in the general uh, uh, context, any person that is invaded, uh, invaded in a context of oppression, are we going to say that uh, we're going to let them do what they want? This is not virtue. This is vice. This is leaving your own responsibility that is incumbent on you. So this is what uh, God Almighty had said. If you become patient, uh, you will be rewarded for that. This doesn't apply to this context. Uh, so, And you find in another context that there is another surah, and we should not mix up the two ayahs. So jihad in Islam is an ethical position vis-à-vis -vis the oppressors. Al-Jihad is here for three practical motivations, self-defense, the support of uh, the vulnerable, and also to have the freedom of worship. These are the things that should not be mixed up. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that jihad is a defense against injustice and oppression. Those who died or were killed defending their money are martyrs. Those who are killed defending their family are martyrs, those who have been killed as a result of uh, oppression or uh, injustice or grievance are martyrs. So uh, they are considered martyrs. All these are authentic uh, hadith. Uh, that is why I think there is no use to give a, ling a religious dimension to jihad. Uh, so you don't need uh, when you have a national liberation war against an oppressing power, you don't need to resort uh, to a religious motivation. National liberation movements, uh, they adopted jihad. And also the revolutions against oppressors are forms of jihad. And we cannot necessarily or do not necessarily necessarily need to call them so. So jihad should be an ethical message and not a creedal message. Some empires wanted to expand their territories under the slogan of jihad. This is history, and this is not revelation. And we have to differentiate between history and revelation. There is another new problematic issue pertaining to jihad in war and peace in our Islamic societies today. This is very important indeed because Muslims, they did not concentrate on the injustice inside their countries. And Ibn Khaldun said that Abdul Malik bin Marwan asked somebody about Al Hajjaj bin Yusuf and he was praising him and he said, I left him uh, oppress other people on his own. So he was 
practicing and monopolizing injustice. And we say today that uh, states monopolize violence and not only legitimate violence, also illegitimate violence. The Islamic culture in the uh, era of empires, they were trying to defend themselves against the external enemy and they forgot about the internal violence. So even Christian states that have had their own wars, they resorted also to combat and resist violence internally. And after that, we had the Magna Carta before the end of the Crusades, in addition to the revolutions such as the English Revolution, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And it is not strange that the Islamic uh, culture is subjected more to internal violence more than external violence. And we need today to concentrate on internal violence and to liberate ourselves from any kind of apolog apol apologetic discourse. We do not want countries to monopolize illegitimate violence against their own people. Dr. Tariq Ramadan talked about points that are very important indeed. And if you allow me for a minute to underline certain things, uh, what we need today is not sermons and advice, but we need positions. Uh, we can all talk about the peacefulness of our religions, but what is required is that our religious scholars should have real positions vis-a-vis -vis the grievances that we face. We do not want just to give sermons and try to praise our religions as religions of peace because there is a vacuum in our Islamic ummah. There is a scientific, scholastic kind of vacuum. When we don't have scholars, you will find other people people taking the space and talking to people. So we have to try to build our efforts on a strategy. So that is why we find such fighting that is not ethically restricted. I think that the jihadi chaos that we find and which is inimical to Muslims and non-Muslims would only be rectified if we have insightful kind of jihad that is based on ethical restrictions and also on political strategy. You cannot help an oppressor at the expense of another oppressor. You cannot have such kind of thing. You cannot be partial to regimes of violence against uh, groups of violence. Sometimes, sometimes the war is between two oppressors, and you're not supposed to help one oppressor at the expense of other oppressor. And sometimes you can have uh, certain communities that have uh, non-ethical positions against the liberation of certain countries, and they distort all components of jihad. And here you find yourself following such people. No, you should not do that, because some groups have attacked these countries. We are not going to help an oppressor against another oppressor. The ethical position entails that you help the person that has been subjected to injustices against the oppressor. And may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Center for the Invitation for this great opportunity to participate with you to bring my particular perspective about uh, war, uh, just war, al jihad, resistance in the contemporary area. So, the legitimization, the legitimization of violence in, uh, in Islam and its practical contemporary application by mostly non-state armed groups, has reached prominence in current public debate, both in the Muslim world and in the Western world as well. The armed campaign of Tanzim Daula in particular against several countries have put forward those debates first about uh, Yusad Belum, under what circumstances can actors use war, and Yusad Belum regarding the, the, the practical use of war. 
These debates have been politically used by two contended sides, both in Western and in Muslim countries. One of them would want to argue that Islamic actors using violence somehow reflects what would be the essence of this religion, while the other side would argue rather that other socio-economic political grievances or particular ideologies sometimes would, would be the real reason and that religion is just a cover for deeper objectives. My personal position is that I do not intend to present a theoretical point of view that has been presented today in this panel and previously, as well as uh, what partially discussed yesterday. My position as a social scientist is to contextualize these arguments from my own uh, perspective. I'm closer to what the center would describe as ulema al-waqia, or even talib al-ilm al-waqia, because we will always ask for new, for new knowledge. So I would like to examine the, the broader political context in which arguments where religious arguments about violence in Islam were used by political actors in the, in the modern area. This contextualization is important because religious texts cannot be understood without a particular spatial and temporal context in which they become more relevant to individuals who are going to use violence. Even though they can have, as individuals or as groups, you can have some ideological commitments, your ideological commitments cannot be dissociated from the circumstances in which you live. So my presentation will cover three main points. First, I will discuss some contemporary analysis and points of views in political and academic debates about this particular uh, issue. Second, I will discuss the paradigms, or I will uh, differentiate different patterns of violence under which violence has been used by, uh, by, act by non-state actors claiming they, their religious belonging to Islam. And finally, I will introduce a few potential ways forward, some of which have been discussed yesterday, some of which have still have to be, uh, to be understood properly. So, contemporary debates about violence in Islam have mostly been triggered by the first attack against, uh, against the US in 9-11, and then multiplied after those, a few attacks in, uh, in Spain, uh, London, etc. Those debates have been intensified more recently for the past few years, with the mobilization of thousands of youth from Arab countries, Western countries, and, uh, and, and even Asian countries to uh, and joining uh, war or joining jihad in, uh, in Syria. It's interesting to note that in the 2000s, people were more willing to discuss the political argument or the political grievances for, uh, for young, uh, young Muslims joining armed conflict mostly at the time it was in, uh, in Iraq. While now, for the past few years, theological arguments or theological rationals have been somehow put forward, both by politicians and by academics. And I think that we do have to engage with, uh, with this issue. So an important academic debate reflecting two very, uh, two very opposed or contradictory positions have been, <coughs> have been framed primarily in France with regards to the phenomenon, so-called radicalization, even though there are huge issues with regards to the term radicalization of violent ex extremism. Whether the, the joining of, uh, of non-state armed groups in Syria reflects somehow an Islamization of a pre-existing radicalism, or whether some theological issues, whether the spread of Salafism or the ideological commitment to the creation of, or the revival of the Khilafah or the establishment of Islamic law in some Muslim countries are the real reason for why the people mobilize. And those issues are not just academic, not just among, among scholars studying this, uh, these issues theoretically. Those have important critical political repercussions because it will frame our answers, our state answers. Do, they have, do Western states have to somehow answer the, some religious development among their youth, or are other political issues to be addressed first? Or is there a combination, uh, a combination to, be, uh, to be done? <coughs> What's interesting to note as well is that those debates have impacted the Muslim world. If we look at the 2000s, what were uh, Arab countries primarily discussing? They were discussing the primary importance of political issues to explain why people would rather to violence. So we had the Palestinian issue 
being under military occupation would explain why you would join armed resistance against uh, those military forces, or to explain the, the impact of the war in Iraq among uh, a huge amount of youth. But now, for the past few years, we see, even in Muslim countries, the issue of the theology, the so-called theology of violence, has become increasingly discussed. So there were, a few years ago, there was a conference in Turkey, in Mardin, about Ibn Taymiyyah, about what is the correct, or so-called correct, if there was one correct interpretation of Ibn Taymiyyah about those issues. More recently, uh, six months ago, something like that, there was a conference in Chechnya by, by, by a leader that does not have a lot of lessons to teach us about religious dialogue and about religious interpretation, about whether it's the spreading of Salafism in their abroad that would account for this phenomenon, regardless of his state and other similar state actions toward their political opposition. In many cases, we can see that theological debates have been used by authoritarian regimes to justify their actions and to discredit any kind of political arguments uh, that could be used uh, against them. So we have also a general recently calling for religious reforms, the same general that has been slaughtering his political opponents in the streets of, uh, of the capital of his country. So without denying that some theoretical arguments have been articulated by these actors, there is a risk in addressing only the religious roots without understanding the political context in which those religious arguments take place and in which they become relevant to a huge amount of youth who are not <coughs> particularly religious or were not particularly religiously committed beforehand. So, for example, yesterday was mentioned the, the issue of a few, a, few, uh, a few scholars who are important for these groups. For example, from Said Khut to Ayman al Zawahiri to Anwar Arulaki, can we actually really understand them or understand their influence without understanding what they've been through in, some, uh, in, uh, in prison or the torture, etc.? So, the second part is uh, the patterns of violence. <coughs> when people in the Muslim and non Muslim world speak about jihad, often we, uh, we put together a lot of different actions that should be differentiated in the first place because the issue would be to delegitimize the use of violence in Islam in absolute without, un without understanding and comprehending the particular conditions in which violence is exerted. <coughs> and that's also very critical to understand how theology and politics relate with one another in different, uh, in different cases. So the first pattern of violence that we can see used by uh, Muslim actors was mentioned just, just before me is violence against occupation. Violence against occupation can arguably, arguably represent the essence of what would be armed jihad in Islam, the resistance against a foreign, uh, foreign occupi occupant of your land. And that, wide, that theological position is widely shared across ideologies and political leanings and even is even recognized internationally speaking. That's never been controversial. <coughs> and so many movements in the Muslim world on the occupation have indeed resorted to violence. It was usually, sometimes we have some uh, Sufi sheikhs or Mujahid uh, leaders, for example, Al-Qassam in, uh, in Palestine or, <coughs> or what we've seen in, uh, in North Africa. The rationale of Armed, of armed resistance in Islam, in that case, it's very clear. It's not as religious as it is political to infringe a huge cost on foreign powers to prevent them from perpetuating their situation. This situation has been continued to some extent in Palestine and Chechnya. So regardless of what the argument can be used, what is the theological background of some groups using violence against occupation, the essence of jihad in that case is very similar. It's about a fight, a political fight against occupation. <coughs> the second pattern of violence is the use of violence against Muslim leaders. That's quite a recent development. A few presentations, well, there was one presentation before that mentioned that jihad before was used against the foreign enemy, not inside the Muslim world. That's mostly a development of the, of the 20th century, primarily in Egypt, in Syria, then in Algeria, now again in, uh, in Syria. In those cases, especially in the 70s, when this phenomenon started in, uh, in Egypt, it was primarily university graduates, uh, highly educated, sometimes from, uh, from, usually from the middle class as well, drawing upon some theoretical arguments to justify their fight 
against one regime, against their own uh, domestic regime in particular circumstances as, a, as an answer to the lack of political inclusion of the, of the opposition and of white patterns of repression. So the, the rationale that they can use in their arguments drawing upon theological concepts such as, such as Al-Taifa and Montanera can be cannot be understood and can, should not be understood solely for their religious foundations. They should be understood in the context in which they were developed. In most cases, those are people who have been reacting against certain patterns of repression and the absence of inclusion, who then looked upon their religious sources to justify what they were doing. We cannot just reverse the relation of causality here. Then the last one is the one that's still influential now. It was, it mostly emerged, it was an outgrowth of this development, and it emerged during the war in Afghanistan, the rise of the so-called uh, Salafi al-Jihadiya trend in the uh, Arab and, and Muslim world. This one combines the use of violence against Muslim leaders, plus the use of violence against Western targets, whose states are deemed responsible for supporting those authoritarian regime in the first place. They realized at some point of time in the 90s that they could not change their domestic regimes without attacking the ones who were supporting these regimes. <coughs> um, so we can see that re with the recent developments, those, tr those patterns of violence have somehow been, uh, been mixed. Some people resisting occupation have claimed allegiance in some cases, like in Chechnya mostly, to uh, Salafi al-Jihadiyya. Others who were initially Salafi jihadists became closer to or adopted growingly um, a primary focus on their own uh, domestic regime without renouncing their previous, uh, their previous commitments. So now to conclude, what are the ways forward? Can we solely argue that jihad as armed struggle is political? and that there is no theoretical foundations that cannot be addressed and that Muslims somehow don't have to do anything against these issues. Many Muslims would, uh, would say that. Some would deny that these actors are Muslims, think they are just Khawarij, we can't do anything against them, we just have to fight them. Others would just say, no, no Muslims really would do that, so they are just Istirbartia, we are just the intelligence. However, my position would be that we have to address both sides. We have to address both the political rationals, the political reasons and foundations for these actions of violence, and the religious rationale as well, and the, re and the religious arguments developed over time. Because even though political rationals usually <coughs> prevail, we cannot deny that at some point of time, people become convinced in their own the uh, theology, and that they cannot reject it altogether without without understanding where, where it stood, where it stands. So the first point is we have to address the political roots of these conflicts. So in the first case, it's quite clear armed occupation rises from the denial of self-determination to a few determined people and will remain regardless of the situation. Regardless of the theoretical arguments that have been elaborated by those actors, the essence of the conflict is the same, it's about armed resistance against foreign occupation. That was the case in North Africa, that's still the case in Chechnya and in Palestine. Then the second point concerns uh, Western foreign policies. While well, a condemnation of any act of violence against civilians, well then the Muslim, the non-Muslim world should be clear because there are no justifications to target those who are not directly involved in armed struggle against you. We cannot deny that even Tanzim Adawla, when they attacked a few countries in Europe, such as France, did not attack them, contrary to a lot of propaganda that we heard in the French media in particular, for what the French are, or for what Westerners are, but for what they do and what their states do abroad. We, we cannot just take the arg, we cannot just neglect those real rationals that will never justify anything, that just explain it and contextualize it. If you read the testimonies of those participated, those who were uh, as victims in those actions, those who were arrested coming back from Syria, etc., the rationale is very clear. There is no doubt about that. It was about uh, Western policies. So it means that Western states cannot just defend their strategic, their strategic interests abroad with military force without never expecting any kind of backfire. Time has changed and 
our actions in some countries will have consequences back home. It's not like, if it, like it was a few decades ago where I could just launch war without any repercussions. States cannot declare that they are immune to developments, uh, to, those de uh, to those actions that are a reaction to their occupation of Iraq, for example, or foreign interventions in uh, Middle Eastern countries. At the same time, foreign policies toward Muslim countries have to evolve as well. We cannot just be, remain cynical with our, with our interest abroad, continue to supporting that kind of very op of oppressing regimes, such as the Syrian regime, the Egyptian regimes, and never expect a reaction from their political opposition. What we do will have, uh, will have a reaction, whether it's through occupation or through the support of that type of, uh, of regime. So we need to have more equilibrated relations with those countries in the first place. And indeed, we cannot deny that the recent mobilization of many youth from European countries in particular for the Syrian Jihad cannot be totally dissociated from real political grievances. Have people mobilized because of Palestine? Maybe not directly or per se, but the combination of unfair foreign policies, of discrimination of religious symbols in Western societies, and real socioeconomic grievances as well, provide the context in which some ideological commitment become more, uh, more pertinent and resonate with their individual experiences. And those have to be addressed as well. And that includes the political rationals of their actions. The second point concerns Muslim countries. These the theological or ideological developments have not emerged in a vacuum. The impossibility of political reform in most Arab and Muslim countries, with some notable exceptions, the persistence of authoritarian regimes, and, I'm Jennifer, and the severe repression of political forces have created the conditions in which these arguments have become relevant. People have not woken up one day reading Ibn Taymiyyah and thinking I have to take weapons against the state. There was a particular context in which certain arguments have resonated with their experiences. So we cannot, again, reverse the causation here. Because in the right circumstances, most type of political actors, even those with violent commitments, can be accommodated and can be included in, uh, in those regimes under the, right, uh, uh, under the right conditions. It also means that Western countries will have to accept that Muslim countries will have to find their own ways forward in terms of reform. Muslim countries and Arab countries will not just adopt or copy-paste Western political regimes, but will have to find their own organic way or organic response to this, uh, to this development and their own ways of including um, the demands of their population in agreement with their cultures and values. Finally, to conclude, not everything is political, and so what should be the, the position of religious scholars? We cannot just wash our, or religious scholars cannot just wash their hands of what is going on and have to take a position as well. The first issue is about difference of opinion. Although I have my own issue about the issues of radicalization, the radicalization and those concepts and what they entail, there were recent discussions about the radicalization as the acceptance of multiple systems of thoughts towards more inclusive visions, accepting that the, accepting to agree to disagree with the other. And that's an issue among, among Muslims, unfortunately. People fight a Salafia against Ashariya, Ashariya against Salafia, different madhab, different, uh, different positions, without accepting the existence of Ikhsilafat in the first place. That will be the first issue that will have to be addressed, the issue of inclusivity of religious thoughts within Islam. The second one is about religious scholars. Yesterday, somebody mentioned the independence of religious institutions, and that's a central issue that remains. The financial and political independence of religious institutions will have to be addressed by Muslim, uh, by Muslim countries. They will never have any credibility in, ref in presenting their particular approach to religion without real independence. Finally, can we have religious scholars debating intricate points of fiqh or aqidah with a less acute understanding of reality? That will be an issue as well to address, how to, to foster this dialogue between those who are more akin to discussing the text and the traditional Qur'an Kalim wa Sunnah 
and those who will present an issue of, of, of their own understanding of reality and how can we find a way out with these two uh, in consideration. So uh, thank you, thank you everyone, thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much also for keeping time, finishing on time. Uh, now we have <coughs> uh, time for uh, discussions on the basis of what we heard from the um, speakers till now. Um, do we have questions or shall I start with first? We have questions, okay. Uh, so you and then you, three, okay. So we, we take the first round of three questions. So please, here. Would you please raise your hand? Yes. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace of God be upon you. Thank you very much for your interventions. You talked in your interventions. Just. Raja'an fal ta'arifi bi nafsiki wa Bushra Asimlali from Morocco. I'm one of the graduates of the center. You talked in your intervention about the reasons behind violence from a religious and historical and psychological perspectives. What about the economic dimension? What about economic interests that have been referred to by Dr. Tariq Ramadan in his intervention yesterday? What about uh, firms and lobbies that do directly benefit from this uh, when it comes uh, to the confrontations uh, and the expansion of their weapons market. Uh, what about the Middle East and the Israeli plan regarding the neighboring countries? This plan has been implemented in Iraq and now it is being implemented in Syria. Don't you think that these are the main reason that uh, aim to take advantage of the conflicts taking place for their own interests. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace of God be upon you all. Ahmed Al Janahi from Qatar. I have a question to Dr. Shankiti. You mentioned an interesting idea. You talked about the difference between wars in the era of the imperial state and war during the era of the modern state. And you talked about three motivations for violence or for fighting. Sharia aims always to have peace, and if we go into the regimes we have nowadays, including the international community and the United Nations, all of these institutions are there in order to implement this kind of conceptualization of Islam, which is peace, how this is going to have an impact on jihad. Now, the idea, yes, you preserve your borders, but if you are not going to be an, a strong power, you're going to be invaded from a civilization perspective, if not uh, having a war waged against, against you. I would like to thank the different speakers for their deep uh, interventions. We did learn a great deal from their interventions. And I find a common denominator between all three interventions, all three speakers uh, talked about uh, the duty of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is the establishment of the state. And if we add to that that there are some people see al khilafa as one of the fundamentals of al aqida or creed. That is why we find our youth uh, find their answers in the way they want it. So why do you think that the establishment of the state is one of the 
fundamentals of the creed or aqidah. You talked about uh, the differences between the different uh, uh, prophets. Uh, you can try to emulate any of those uh, prophets. You should not set fortresses dividing between the different uh, prophets that we have. Uh, and the Quran is very clear in that respect that we should emulate all of them. Dr. Shankiti talked about uh, Islam as a realistic uh, kind of religion. So uh, when we talk about God, is God a predestination or should we look at it from a different perspective? The speaker, the third speaker, talked about political and psychological dimensions. We should not necessarily be either victims uh, or oppressors. Uh, so in certain situations, should we either be only victorious or only oppressed or victims? Uh, so we should not also deal with the West as one block. Uh, the Western civilization, the secular civilization is one block. We cannot claim that they are all one block. If we look into the Western society, there are so many representations of that West and different positions. Uh, I found that uh, the spirit of this session was a kind of a defensive kind of discourse and not a critical discourse. Uh, we are here to have a critical discourse. Uh, I think that we needed to deepen this discussion even further for us to benefit from the discussion taking place. We'd like to start with the first question, which is to do with the economic dimension. Idan al Dr. Jerem. The situation going on at the moment. I think it's obvious that we cannot deny that the five, five countries that, exposed, that export most weapons in the world are those who have the veto in the Security Council, which, which is quite paradoxical for countries whose mission officially is to preserve peace and security in the world. And those are huge contradictions. And then the, the issue would be, what can we do in that regard? As, mostly as Westerners, because that's where their power are, that's where we can influence them from within. And in that sense, I do think that there are ways forward, in the sense that there are, I think some Nordic countries have been pressurized by their population into boycotting exportation or preventing exportation to certain type of countries who don't abide by certain regulations. We can mention as well the, all the BDS movement across political forces in, in opposition to the military support or to the, the selling of military weapons to the, to the Israeli state, for example. And so that will be mostly an issue, I think, that can be solved within uh, European countries themselves in common fight with other, uh, with other forces including uh, non-Muslim forces. You cannot just do that by, uh, by yourselves, as uh, Tarkar Madan mentioned yesterday. Thank you very much. You, your eminence, uh, Sheikh Abu Zaid, uh, you talked and you referred to the ayah And you talked that uh, if there is no evidence, uh, how can you resort uh, to war? From what I read and from what I have seen, and I know that you are very learned when it comes to what is being uh, written and published uh, by our scholars, is there uh, attention paid uh, to this respect? Should there be money spent? Uh, uh, in buying and developing weapons for deterrence, and if those ummas do not do that, uh, they would be committing a act of disobedience. And we know that there are countries that buy weapons uh, uh, for weapons uh, that are not going to be used. So this dimension, how do you read this dimension? How do you classify this dimension? How do you find it in the discussions that are being held by our scholars? Before I 
answer this uh, question, the giant firms and companies that control peace and war. These are the companies that are closely related to the situation. I would like to remind the audience uh, the Nuremberg uh, trials that lasted for months after the defeat of Germany. And we have seen an archive of millions of documents. The judges of Nuremberg, those who have uh, reached an outcome that was very shocking, they say that the first person in charge of Nazism and entering into war is one company, which is the German pharmaceutical company. And there was a decision that was reached not only to hold the Nazis accountable, but to destroy and dismantle this company into three companies, Bayer, Basif, and I do not remember the third name of the company. So sometimes wars are waged in order to promote certain products that are not necessarily military weapons. That is why in the GATT that took place in uh, Morocco, the meeting that took place in Morocco, and we have seen the signature of the final agreement uh, in the 80s, one of the European presidents uh, said, and everybody agreed with him, open your market to us or we're going to try to reopen these markets militarily. So the economic dimension is very clear indeed. And the whole world is manipulated by a small number of companies, not necessarily those that manufacture weapons. And also the application of that on the situation. And people who are oppressed, they become used by this kind of a political game. So these uh, manufacturing companies, uh, they make uh, uh, these situations. There is one country wanted and decided to keep one tribe poor because most of them are enlisted members of the tribe. So the investment in poverty is something that we have even in elections. Those who manufacture uh, Poverty are the ones uh, that use those pe poor people as weapons. That is why the economic dimension is very decisive. That is why Islam calls for economic and social justice uh, because this would be blocking any clashes between the people. And we have so many jurists who have uh, specialized in this field. We have one jurist who, Ar-Rukn Khattab, uh, he has the highest military rank. He spent 60 years uh, theorizing on Islamic military. And he talked about the importance of military independence and also to condemn any of those uh, military uh, military uh, deals uh, that are uh, not going to be uh, f deals for weapons that are not going to be used because these weapons sometimes are faulty and not good enough to be used so he has been in uh, condemning such a thing in so many of the books uh, that he wrote. Uh, so we have a kind of a hypocrisy. So the wars, uh, uh, the ministries of wars have been changed hypocrisy, uh, hypoc uh, hypocritically into uh, ministries of defense. Uh, the last person who theorized on just uh, war is from Britain. At the time, it was transformed into uh, ministries of uh, defense. Uh, we have seen what we have seen taking place uh, in the world. Also, Al-Qaradawi, 
wrote a book uh, about why have we been defeated in 1967 and how can we become victorious. So we have so many jurists who have uh, issued so many rulings with regard to the uh, uh, what is obligatory, what is collective obligation, individual obligation, and so on and so forth. Uh, there was a question that was posed to uh, Dr. Ashanqiti. So the concept of jihad, now the lines dividing defensive and offensive has become very clear. It wasn't as clear in the imperial era when Muslims were fighting Byzantium or the north of the Levant era because there was no international norm that was saying that this is your land, this is my land, this is your territory, this is my territory. There were no conventions at the time. So dividing line between defense and offense uh, disappeared, uh, did not exist in the past, but now we have conventions and we have norms. Uh, and the international power that has drafted these conventions are the least committed to these conventions and agreements. Uh, and uh, at the moment, we have seen a transformation from Ministry of War into Ministry of War, of, uh, from Ministry of War into Ministry of Defense. We have seen the lack of respect uh, of uh, the term or notion of defense itself. Uh, so uh, There is a new international reality, which is very important. And this is a human gain, humanitarian gain, and criminalizes ethically the aggression of a state against another state, even if people do not pay heed to this principle. But this is a principle that is very important that should be welcomed. And uh, aggression today is no longer a direct kind of aggression. Sometimes we support an authoritarian regime that conducts aggression against his own or her own people. And also, uh, when you have forms of aggression that deprive you of your own freedom and dignity, sometimes the victims of such kind of aggression is much higher than the victims of direct war. I do not have an answer to this kind of uh, aggression. What is the ethical response to this kind of aggression? If the international community supports an authoritarian who killed half a million of his people. So this uh, is uh, supported uh, by giving this country diplomatic and political cover, by giving that regime weapons. So there are new problematic issues that should be rectified, that should be revisited when it comes to tanqih al-manat and try to understand the dimensions of this new reality and uh, far from the dimensions of the imperial state of the past. So the establishment of the state, is this something that uh, is incumbent? Uh, is this uh, part of the creed? Is this uh, something that is supposed to be carried out? Uh, So what I like in the ideas of Shahrur is that he differentiated between the discourse of uh, all God and all prophet. Uh, and this is not easy. We do not have 100% uh, in any kind of interpretive uh, theory. So if uh, the discourse is to the prophet, is uh, for uh, the prophet to follow a certain kind of pathway or to be or 
or if it is to do with tasking, tasking the prophet to establish a state. So because there was a vacuum, a tribal vacuum, that is why Prophet Muhammad was tasked to establish a state. Uh, had uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, been uh, tasked uh, during the era of uh, Christ, uh, he wouldn't have been tasked to build a state or establish a state akin to uh, Jesus Christ. So if it is a tasking, it is a historical kind of tasking within a historical context. Uh, that's why we don't get into the issue of imamat, such as the method that the Shia have used. The issue of khilafat, khilafat is subject to ijtihad and amendment and it is not an issue in the heart of religion such as Tawheed or monotheism etc uh, one brother objected to distinguishing between the prophets we do not distinguish between the prophets I don't want to sound apologetic but sometimes we fall into that trap when they say uh, Jesus is love and Muhammad is a combatant it is not like that but simply put if Muhammad remained in Mecca then he would be the exact way of Jesus but one of them had only one responsibility and the other had two responsibilities. But we do not distinguish between the prophets and the messengers. And if there is distinction, it is from Allah. Allah said we have preferred some prophets or messengers over others. So what is the difference between the religion of uh, Muhammad and others uh, so these prophets have different methods and so we were not thinking about preferring a prophet over another one this is just to realize the differences that history plays a role. Okay, so so there is a language of history, and Allah has sent messengers and prophets. The number is different Quran was divided into Mecki era and Medini era so there is Mecki uh, revelation and Medini revelation and there is abrogated an abrogator so reality imposes itself so Allah said, if there were angels walking on earth, we would have sent down to them an angel who is a messenger. Allah said also, there is no messenger who was sent except that he is a human being walking in the markets. So Allah speaks to us in the language that has so many meanings and dimensions and Allah spoke to us through a certain language 
with allegories sometimes and different methods. And uh, this is the humanity of prophets and relativity is also is as such so that we don't fall in monopolizing the truth. The truth is one, but the right is multiple. So, uh, His Eminence uh, explains at great length uh, this historical context. Uh, when I talked about the experiences and the differences of experiences between Christ and Muhammad and concentrated only on the historical dimension, there is a difference between the two messages or the two revelations. في أداء السلطة بعد وجودها نعم السياق التاريخي وز... Yes, the historical context is part of the legislative will God knows best where to send his message Why would we send a message to a political vacuum or to a community in which we have an established state There is wisdom in that Why would we have to have this vacuum It is a kind of a tabula rasa in which we want to have this message So this is going to be the seal of all messages So the legislative space is a very wide space and I have two chapters of a new book in this particular respect. The values of construction and performance, all of them are based on Quran and authentic uh, prophetic traditions and not quotations from uh, jurists. Uh, so I think this is very clear as far as I know. And uh, my friend Yasser maybe can have a look uh, at the book and maybe can use it because I did quote either uh, uh, Quranic texts or prophetic uh, tradition. Al Khilafa has two meanings uh, the value based meaning and the historical meaning. Meaning. So the first value is to have a state in keeping with Islamic values, in keeping with the religious text. As for the historical dimension, there is uh, a general kind of presidency of all Muslims in keeping with al-Mawardi that would unite all Muslims together. This is a kind of a historical conceptualization, and we are not there to abide with this kind of historical conceptualization. We have to differentiate between history and revelation. If we are supposed to be under one banner in the past, this is no longer applicable today. Even in the fifth century, when we have seen the disintegration of the Abbasid city state, so we have seen a difference in that perception. Yes, we need the unity of Muslim. Yes, this is obligatory, but the unity of Ummah is not uh, is not equal to the unity of the state. Uh, the Quran talks about the unity of the Ummah and not the unity of the state. We can be one Ummah, but not necessarily be one state, uh, such as the Baghdadi's state. Uh, there are people who are much more, much more insightful than al-Baghdadi who looked at Islamic unity in a different way. as Nuri in his book Al-Khilafa, he talked about Al-Khilafa, which becomes a kind of an Eastern Union. How can we unify all Muslims, taking into account ethnic and cultural idiosyncrasies and particularities of each and every country? So also we have another right who has divided the Islamic world based on six kind of components. We have the Chinese Islamic country, uh, world, and we have the Turkish Islamic world, the Arab Islamic world. Uh, so we are not talking about the unity of the state. Yes, as per our texts, we have to have a legitimate authority in keeping with the texts, but we are not bound to follow a particular historical form, and God knows best.
فيما يخص فكرة الدولة والخلافة وكان هناك إدفاء للشرعية لبعض أعمال العنف من أجل الخلافة إذا ما الذي تعنيه الخلافة في البداية فإن المجموعات خلافة ويلكم باك فور ذا مسلم وورلد اتترا ات واز نوت اونلي ا ريليجيوس كوميتمنت از ماتش از ات واز ا بوليتيكال ايديا اوف برينجينغ باك يونيتي تو ذا تو ذا مسلم وورلد جيفينغ سترينث تو ذا مسلم وورلد اند ريفايفينغ ذا رول اوف اوف اسلام ان ان سوسايتي سو ذير از ذيس كلير دايمنشن اوف ذا بوليتيكال بروجيكتس هوز هوز ديتيلز اوف not necessarily been clearly addressed by them over time. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, shall we take in, uh, other three questions? One, two, three, uh, four. Okay, then we take four. For the little Sheikh. Shukran, Thank you very much. I would like to thank the different panelists. Dr. Mohammed Mukhtar Ashanqiti, at the end of his intervention, he said something very important, and I would like to add something very important with regard to Al Khilafa. Islam, as a religion, has a number of practical rulings. That is why we have to have a state. This is necessary. But uh, to have all these states under one khilafa has become very difficult. We're talking about what is possible. We have these nation states that exist, that have called themselves nation states. Uh, we either leave them as they are with their authoritarianism and failures, and we have seen the destination of our, uh, and destinies of our states, or we seek change either to establish uh, justice, legislations, and there is a space for ishtihad in this realm. And ishtihad should take into account the reality. And also, we are going to deal with what is possible. How I deal with the different societies and communities. There is no harm to have a state that adopts Islam whichever the state is going to be, but this is rejected. This is not accepted locally and internationally. And Islam remains just a number of rulings and feelings that are adopted by people in their own personal ways. And this is inimical to us in actual fact. I would like to understand the uh, Kyle for these uh, very important lectures. I would like also to thank the different speakers uh, for their ideas. Uh, I have an observation regarding the intervention by Sheikh al muqri You said we have to recognize that we have a propensity for violence uh, since the rise of al khawarij or the outlaws i think we are trying to say that there are genes in our blood that push us towards violence in actual fact there isn't an islamic group that has such number of authentic hadith such as al khawarij or the outlaws and the muslims stood against such kind of trend and they condemned it so what was strange how did they deal with al khawarij although they resorted to violence and insisted on bloodshed but we find that the majority of juries say that al khawarij did not start with any, it should not start the fighting, nor should they be fought, and we should not deprive them of their rights, and we should not be fought. Maybe I, st I, I forgot the third one, uh, and the way 
the Muslim society dealt with al Khawarij. They dealt with them very peacefully. A Shafi'i says that Umm ibn Abdul Aziz was insulted by al Khawarij. So if they resort to weapons, resort to weapons. If they fight, fight them. Deal with them peacefully as long as our difference is a difference of opinion. So they allowed them to express their different opinion. If we look into other religions such as Christianity or Judaism, you will not find that uh, violence Islam is much more than violence in Christianity or Judaism. Judaism. In Christianity, we had the courts of inquisition. And if we go into the details, we will find so many, so many of such kind of examples. And also the Jews have so many incidents of violence. They do use their children as a korban for sacrifice. And all these are incidents that are proven. These are not just uh, stories. Uh, so in all religions, we find that there are violent trends. And Karen Armstrong has a very important book in this respect. She talks about uh, fields of blood. Uh, she talks about religion and the history of uh, violence. She was a nun and she was interviewed and they told her why is Islam behind this terrorism that we find and she said there is no link between the religion of Muhammad and terrorism as there is no link between Jesus Christ and the Crusades. I call upon our eminent sheikh to comment about this particular issue. There is another point that I would like to quickly mention. I have an observation. Maybe it is a mistake from my end. I think that the three papers, although they are very respectable scientifically, but the three papers did not strongly touch upon the subject of the conference or of this session, which is the peaceful and violent means towards a just peace. I haven't heard much relevant to this particular topic or theme, which is peaceful and violent means towards a just peace. Dr. Tariq Ramadan talked about jihad. Please ask a direct question. With regard to violence inside Muslim societies, we have three main circles. The first circle is a political kind of movement and uh, or political reform. The second circle, which is those uh, to push them away, to ward them off. And also we have the circle of sedition and uh, civil wars. So what is the legitimate component between these three circles? Uh, thank you so much. Halim al from Doha Institute. My question is to His Eminence Sheikh Al-Idrisi. You talked about the propensity to violence and how Islam accepts the other. And when we look into the use of uh, violence or the wrong usage of the word uh, jihad in order to justify non-tolerance towards the other. So we need to solve such a matter. So what about, I mean, solving the issue is time consuming, but what about prevention? Because those people who have started 
acting violently have been pushed into it. So we would like to know what are the means of prevention because our kids today are the ones who are going to be in control and we do not want them to fall into the same circle. My question, the second one to Dr. Ashanqiti, you talked about our presence as a third party between two groups, between oppressors, governments, groups, But we, as a third party, as a third component, we are not part of the conflict or party to the conflict. What I do understand, we have to reform and we have to set reconcile between these groups. So we have to work on reforming this relationship, reconciling this relationship. If we take sides and we are asked to reconcile, how can we strike a balance? I think reforming, reconciling relations Reconciling these relations means that we should have a fifth chair for somebody representing ISIS, whether we like it or not, these people are part of us, maybe they have made a mistake. If we want to reconcile relations means that we have to talk to the other party. We cannot just keep on talking from our side and neglect the other side. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Because the session, um, as was pointed out earlier by the professor, is talking about peaceful and violent means towards a just peace. And I think um, most of what I've heard so far about the jihad is focused on the violent. And I was wondering if we could elaborate a little bit on the peaceful. Um, the, the reason why I, I would like to hear something from either side, I think uh, one of the sheikhs mentioned, he was mentioned in Nuremberg. Um, can, we know that governments can force people to get out of the streets, for example, if they're protesting. But can, can governments force people to get out of their houses when they're not protesting or protesting in another way, like by not cooperating? And I'd really love to hear um, your thoughts on uh, not cooperating um, in, in any way, shape, or form as a means towards a just peace, um, as a means of resistance. Researcher, we have three kinds of violence. There is individual violence or collective violence, as ISIS, for instance, and we have the violence of the state against its citizens or the violence of a number of citizens under a religious or political umbrella, we have a higher kind or level of violence that is exercised by the international community or by a number of countries as we see here today. The problem is that there is an intersection between these uh, different kinds of levels when it comes to description or analysis or uh, reaching the outcomes of what should be done. So the question, to what extent was the elite able to deal with each party separately, individuals or the state or external states, because we need to have the possibility to raise awareness and for people to be able to differentiate between these forms of violence. Thank you so much. We still have 10 minutes left. I'm going to give each of the panelists three minutes to comment about the questions that have been posed. I do not want to repeat the questions. When I talked about Al-Khawarij or the outlaws, 
this is part of the self-criticism. Our people are sometimes inclined to violence when we talk about uh, the uh, media, propaganda, intelligence uh, uh, services that try to come up with phenomena such as Daesh or ISIS or Boko Haram and so on and so forth. This is going to leave us within a circle in which we just try to blame the others. So if the others are planning that for us, why would we respond? So in order to self-criticize ourselves, we have to try to revisit what is taking place. And Muslims in Uhud, the Quran did not talk about external factors, which is Quraysh, but it talked about internal factors. So the Quran talked and concentrated about the internal factors. So the Quran only concentrates on this issues to do with the self. So the position of Muslims vis-a-vis -vis al-Khawarij or the outlaws and the different rulies are known. And this shows that they were a group that was disowned and they do not follow the sect of the majority. But why did we find people joining this group? Why were they able to rule Morocco after the collapse of the Idrisi state? They have been dividing Morocco for 150 years between Al Mahdiya and Sizil Massa. They have been fighting and killing tribes of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and their roots are still there. So the question, why there is a propensity that people would fall into that? When I started following those who have been detained and tried, I found that many of the people I met them when I was uh, presenting lectures in London, and I talked about the 50% that is dedicated to the other opinion. I was uh, called an infidel, and I was criticized, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it would not be enough just to talk about the role that was played by the intelligence services and so on and so forth. So we have to look into the roots of the matter. We are people. We have the same propensities. This term is not my own term. It is the term of Malik bin Nabi, the propensity to colonialism. And nobody can disclaim uh, Malik bin Nabi's hate for colonialism. So I'm not saying that the ideology of al Khawarij applies to everybody, but this is just an attempt to understand, to seek to know the deep roots in our behavior, in our psychology as human beings, and in the way we select the text and how we apply the text. Can we deny, as Geron said, that these groups, they read the religious text and they deal with, with the religious text? That is why we should not marginalize the religious scholars because these religious texts should not be hijacked whether these are religious texts that should be used. Karen Armstrong in her book that was translated, I read it a few days ago before I came here and this is a book that is worthy of reading. Yes, this is a lady of a Christian culture. She was a nun but she was also learned in Islam and in Islamic culture and civilization when it comes to the use of violence. She acquitted Islam from violence and also she dealt with how Islam dealt with violence and how she tackled issues to deal with the Umayyad and the Abbasid and so on and so forth. And this is the reality. And Karen Armstrong uh, tried to clarify this point. Uh, so the preventive point that one of the speakers talked about, uh, we 
talk intellectually with other scholars, but we have to adopt a different dimension. We have to be educational, and we have to be able to put an end to this violent behavior by our children. When we look at Goldenstein, uh, the uh, killer, serial killer in Al Khalil uh, Mosque, uh, he killed uh, so many children in Hebron and how he killed people and how he pushed his own father violently to kiss the grave of Goldenstein. Here lies the problem. I'm just trying to be self-critical uh, of this uh, military kind of mentality. And uh, me and Eva Charlotte, we wrote a book. Uh, and Eva Charlotte was uh, very bold to talk about uh, the violent roots of the Judaistic culture. I also talked about our self-criticism, the same thing applies to Tamer rank. He established a Tatar empire, and we have seen this military commander who killed his own father and was subjected to torture. Tamer rank did not uh, need to read about paganism to kill one third of humanity. So the only reason behind that was uh, psychological deprivation and uh, uh, love deprivation. So this has to do with education and upbringing. Sometimes uh, we do find that in the upbringing. I think we as Muslim, we have to avoid a military reading of history. If we go to the Arab street and ask a question very quickly, if you ask somebody, please summarize the history of Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, during the era in al Medina. He will only talk about Badr and Uhud and the other battles that took place. Uh, so they will try to summarize this whole era in al Medina in the military movements and battles that took place. The same thing applies to other civilizations. Uh, so we read about uh, certain wars and we militarize this history. So we are proud that uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, tried to teach and swap uh, the different uh, uh, prisoners of wars, uh, although that were Muslims were very good in paper manufacturing. And al Barqmaki was uh, there to make Muslims taught, uh, be taught how to, to manufacture paper and uh, ink. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, they would get uh, prisoners of war. Was using this word against any, uh, any Muslim faction, when we start using this word to describe anybody, the main issue is about legitimacy. It's just about denying one particular group any political legitimacy, try, not even trying to understand where they stand, how they adopted violence, etc. Because as soon as you describe them as such, the, the issue is just about getting rid of them. And in the 20th century, everybody has used Khawarij against one another. The, the Egyptian states against the Muslim Brotherhood initially, then the Muslim Brotherhood against some extremist factions, and now extremist factions against others, mostly Tandi uh, Maddaula. But then it brings the idea that somehow they are using violence because of religion or because of some religious commitments or wrong religious interpretations without understanding the context in, in which they were created. Tanzim Madaula, regardless of what we think about them, did they emerge because of particular political circumstances in post-American invasion of, of Iraq or were they created because of some debate that happened hundreds of years ago? Let's be serious about that. It's about current political circumstances, and there are those that we have to address. So I don't think we should personally use this, uh, this description to describe uh, anybody. We should remain objective about why particular groups have adopted violence in specific circumstances. Then a few people have mentioned uh, the issue of peaceful 
or a way for just peace. Personally, my bias would be that everything stems from, from political structures in, in our modern states. You can reform yourself or you can decide to boycott the political regime and that's your own self-resistance. But at the end of the day, I don't think that will have a critical political impact. Everything will be about reform or every, the, the essence of the conflict will be about political reform and about political inclusion of, uh, of, every, of everybody in our, in our states. I think that's where the issue lies more than anything else. Thank you. For Dr. Shamqiti, we have a question on social media and we thank uh, those who are with us through the live streaming from uh, Sister Saleh from Turkey is asking about uh, there is a necessity uh, to expand the understanding of jihad instead of limiting it. She said there is uh, an attempt to limit jihad to be self-defense. Shouldn't we expand it to include other elements so that we come out of the cycle of, of violence. Getting out of the cycle of violence completely is not possible. We are human beings and we see parts ex, uh, of society countering other sides. So we have to be on the right side of this propelling movement from people against another, whether it is peaceful or violent. Those who interpret jihad nowadays to make it a spiritual struggle because they are apologetic, uh, especially after sep September 11 attacks, these are painkillers. Uh, jihad exists in Islam and in Quran in maybe tens or hundreds of verses or ayat. But we should say that Islamic ethical philosophy of this call to fight is discipline uh, and stemming from a strategy. History of mankind did not witness wars that have changed the change on earth uh, in less amount of blood spilled and destruction than the era of the prophet, peace be upon him. So maybe 1,800 people died, uh, give or take. Uh, this is in 10 years of fighting, the prophet, peace be upon him, has launched 60 uh, battles or combats or expedition over 10 year period with an average of an operation every two months. Despite that, those wars, only a limited amount of number of people died with the standard of other wars in the past or in the present. Yet the impact of it was so great in the human history. So we should not speak about idealism. So it will not change our reality if we have a new Martin Luther King or a new uh, Gandhi. Yes, we do need some characters, but this will not be sufficient by itself. At the end of the day, there is uh, a level of cruelty that deserves to be responded to in the same way. If the Europeans said we are nice people, so let the fascists and the Nazis do what they want and we will turn the other cheek to them. What would the destiny of Europe be and what would the destiny of the world be today? So the problem is not that there are people rebelling against the authority, but rather the governor or the ruler is rebelling against the nation and the Islamic jurisprudence in the past is biased toward power at the cost of society. So the chapter of those bugat or oppressors, they are usually uh, groups, not a state. Hajjad bin Yusuf, with all his calamities and oppression, 
is not he's not called an oppressor yet those who rebelled against him are called uh, rebellious or rebels so that's not the logic of Quran. Quran's logic is that if two groups of the believers fight, the rulers could be the ruler could be one of them, and they could be the oppressors, which is the case because they have the motives and the means and the conceit to do that. So generally, we need to liberate ourselves from that pr propensity of being apologetic and always to justify the Islamic history and what happened in it. We are committed with revelation, not history. Also, we don't need to be apologetic against those who want to push us in the corner Islam so that they will keep us saying Islam is not this, Islam is not that, as if Islam is full of negative issues as if we are suspects always seeking to exonerate themselves. So preaching does not change the balance of life. Policy is scale of power and not preaching. Also, we need to understand violence in its political and social contexts. And Dr. Tariq has pointed out to that. Those uh, Syrian and Iraqi fighters among ISIS, where were they six years ago? Were they Salafis? Were they jihadists six years ago? Have the texts that they use in fiqh, have, has it changed? Are they new? Why now? Specifically, what has made those people go to the uh, precipice of craziness or foolishness? So we see that the despotic regimes are the ones who have made those people who were peaceful people in uh, secondary or high school or, or universities to turn to this level of uh, hegemony and cruelty. And also, we here are uh, condemning the cruelty of a poor person, yet we are not against the cruelty of a civilized society, such as when we see drone attacks by those people sipping coffee and sitting behind their computers and launching attacks by drones against civilians and they will be proud and boasting saying oh we got them but if the reaction comes from a vulnerable poor Afghani person then we would say he is a terrorist so smart violence is not better than foolish violence ethically speaking and the violence committed by the state is not better than the violence by groups so we need guidelines and discipline and to know that the key to all that is justice without realizing dignity for mankind and societies violence will go on whether it came through a religious language or a leftist language in some societies the causes are the causes look for injustice and those who help and support injustice those are the reasons thank you may allah reward you uh, dr shanqiti we just want to thank the panelists and also i would like to thank the guests the brothers and sisters and those following us through live streaming and those who interacted with us through social media. I thank you all so much. And with this, we end this session, hoping to meet, inshallah, in the next session. Thank you all. May the peace of Allah be upon you all. Shukr. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without uh, further ado, I have two, a couple of announcements. Number one is with regards to the uh, evaluation form. So please fill in the uh, evaluation form and submit it for yesterday and today's session also, sessions also, and submit them to the uh, registration desk in front of this hall. And the second one is with regards to our lunch break. Uh, so you are all welcome to have lunch together in the next hall at, the, at your right side. So uh, please proceed to that hall. And also the uh, prayer hall is at the left, of, uh, left side of this hall. 
and we'll resume back at 2.40 sharp, insha'Allah. Thank you. So please proceed to the next hall at your right side for lunch. <laughs>